The beautiful and rugged Oregon coast. Towering cliffs, hidden rocks, and treacherous sands have sent countless ships to their ruin to be smashed to driftwood in the unforgiving waves. Along this coast sit nine lighthouses, each built to be a guardian against the dangers that lay hidden among the waves and river sands. From the ferocious winds and offshore rocks at Cape Blanco to the dreaded sandbars of the Umpqua River, each lighthouse stands on a unique part of the Oregon coast. Near the town of Port Orford, on the southern coast, Oregon's highest lighthouse rises from the summit of Cape Blanco. It is a starkly beautiful place where ferocious winter storms stream in from the Pacific, pounding the high cliffs with monstrous surf and winds that frequently reach over 100 miles an hour. The 59-foot Cape Blanco Lighthouse lonely guardian of the most westerly point in Oregon is perched 200 feet above the breaking waves. The Cape Blanco Lighthouse was constructed in 1870, built of materials transported by ship to the beach below the Cape. The structure used 200,000 locally produced bricks. Its beacon was a first order Fresnel lens that could reach 22 miles out to sea. In 1936, the original lens was removed and a second order lens crafted by Henri Laporte of Paris was put in its place. The light is now automated, lit by a 320,000 candle power incandescent bulb. The large lens cage rotates on ball bearings in a sealed bath of oil powered by an electric motor. There are eight flash panels, producing a signature white flash every 20 seconds at sea. Cape Blanco is the only functioning lighthouse in Oregon in which visitors are allowed into the lantern room. Early pioneers to the Cape were Patrick and Jane Hughes, who ran a successful dairy farm near the Sixes River, north of the lighthouse. Their Queen Anne-style home is now fully restored and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It makes for an interesting side trip when visiting Cape Blanco. Although no longer manned by a lighthouse keeper, Oregon's southernmost sentinel continues to warn passing ships of the dangers lurking among the rocks at Cape Blanco. Where the Pacific Ocean meets the Coquille River, the beauty of sea stacks and offshore rocks belie one of the more treacherous river entrances on the coast. The Coquille River Lighthouse, with its octilateral signal building and 40-foot tower, stands guard at the river mouth near the resort community of Bandon. It was built in 1896, a time when the lumber mills and shipyards abandoned were booming. The 
the stuccoed brick lighthouse, with its fourth order limbs originally sat on a small rocky island connected to the mainland by a wooden footbridge. The completion of the North Jetty at the turn of the century connected the Sentinel to the mainland. Even with the beacon in place, many ships came to ruin trying to cross the dangerous bar at the entrance to the river, some nearly plowing through the small lighthouse. For 40 years, the abandoned lighthouse kept its beacon shining and its foghorn guiding boats through the narrow channel. In 1936, a devastating forest fire swept into town, charring everything in its path. The residents fled their homes, heading for the beach and the river. Some even sought shelter in the concrete safety of the lighthouse. When the flames were finally extinguished, only 16 out of 500 buildings remained. The town abandoned went bankrupt. A decrease in ship traffic after the fire caused the lighthouse to be closed in 1939 and it sat abandoned for half a century. In 1991, volunteers relit the lighthouse, this time with a solar power lens. The abandoned lighthouse is now on its way to a full restoration. During the holiday season, the revitalized town of Bandon celebrates by wrapping their beloved sentinel in lights. The diminutive lighthouse at the entrance to the Coquille River is a favorite subject for artists and photographers. And thanks to the dedication of many abandoned residents, it will remain a prominent landmark for the future. Here at Shore Acres, near the mouth of Coos Bay, spectacular waves break against the sandstone cliffs. The erosion that these waves cause is equally spectacular. Whole arms of land have been reduced to rapidly shrinking islands. It is one of these islands that the Lighthouse Board chose for the Cape Arago Lighthouse in 1866. The 25-foot tower was located just offshore of what was then known as Cape Gregory at the southern entrance to Coos Bay. The present lighthouse is actually the third one to be built on the island. The clay and sandstone composition of the small island put the first beacon in danger of being washed away almost as soon as it was lit. In 1908, a second lighthouse, an elegant octagonal wood structure, was built on more stable ground. But even this structure's days were numbered, and it was abandoned in 1934 in favor of a new lighthouse built of reinforced concrete. The third lighthouse tower measured 44 feet in height, placing its fourth order lens more than 100 feet above the tides. The present light source is visible 20 miles out to sea. Getting supplies from the mainland to Lighthouse Island, as it was known, was always treacherous. 
The first footbridge built was called the Bridge of Sighs by lightkeepers because of the frightening noises it would make when being crossed during storms. The present footbridge was built in 1898. The lighthouse was automated in 1966 and is now accessible only to Coast Guard personnel who maintain the solar-powered light and weather instruments. All of the outlying structures have been torn down. As each year's storms continue to wash away parts of the island, the future of the Cape Arago Lighthouse remains uncertain. But for now, it still stands, a monument to the ongoing battle between man and sea. Near Winchester Bay, on the south central coast, Umpqua River Lighthouse overlooks the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area. On foggy nights, its signature red and white beams illuminate the sky. The Umpqua River was a major port in the 1850s, the abundant timber providing building materials for booming San Francisco. But a treacherous entrance to the river became the ruin of many ships, and there were cries for a beacon. The original lighthouse, built in 1856, was the first in Oregon. But it was built on sand, and soon collapsed. Three decades passed before another lighthouse graced this part of the coast. This time, plans wisely placed the new structure well back from the ocean and river. This lighthouse was constructed of two layers of brick with a cement overlay. The tower walls are five feet thick at the base, tapering to 21 inches at the top. Umqua Lighthouse stands 61 feet high, its focal plane hovering 165 feet above the ocean. The large two-ton French first-order Fresnel lens was crafted by Barbier and C of Paris in 1890. It consists of eight lower panels, 24 middle panels, and eight upper panels. A thousand hand-ground clear and red prisms shimmer inside the 72-inch diameter lens. The lens originally rotated, using a clockwork mechanism with a weight that would drop 34 feet down the center of the tower before having to be rewound by the lighthouse keepers. It is now automated, turned by an electric motor and illuminated by a 1,000 watt quartz iodine lamp. With its unique lens and signature red and white beams, the Umpqua River Lighthouse stands watch above the sand dunes of Oregon's central coast.
one of the most photographed lighthouses in the world, Aceta Head Lighthouse rises from a picture-perfect setting on the rugged central Oregon coast just north of Sea Lion Caves. Here, treacherous volcanic rocks jut out into the ocean, earning a wide berth from passing ships. In the early days, this beaconless stretch of coast was known as the Dark Coast. Then, in 1892, work began on a tower at Hasita Head, following the same architectural plans that were being used for the second Umpqua River Lighthouse. In addition to the 56-foot-high tower, two oil houses, a barn, and two Queen Anne-style keeper's residences were constructed. The Hasita Head Lighthouse quickly became its own community, the post office, and a school for the keeper's children, as well as those of settlers in the area. With such a prominent position on the coast, Hasita Head soon became a landmark, drawing visitors from nearby towns. Of the two lightkeeper's residences, only the assistant keeper's home still stands. It is now a popular bed and breakfast with a colorful history. Former guests claim to have seen the apparition of a lady in Victorian dress moving about upstairs or reflected in a mirror in the attic. Experiments with a Ouija board revealed the ghost's name as Rue, trapped inside the house in an endless search for her lost daughter. Others say that Rue is actually the spirit of the child, whose headstone is well hidden in the undergrowth at Devil's Elbow. The lighthouse shall be lighted an hour before sunset. The keepers, provided with a lighting lamp, will ascend to the lantern in the tower and commence lighting the lamp, so that the light may have its full effect by the time twilight ends. Lighthouse lights should be kept burning brightly, free from smoke during each night from sunset to sunrise. Light keepers are required to keep a careful watch and see that the lights under their care are properly trimmed. And during thick and stormy weather, those keepers who have no assistance must watch the light during the entire night. Instructions and directions to Lighthouse and Light Vessel Keepers, 1871. What sets Hasita Head Lighthouse apart from the others in Oregon is that it uses a lens not from France, but from Britain. The two-ton lens manufactured by the Chance Brothers is composed of eight panels for a total of 640 prisms, each prism two inches thick. The five-wick lamp could be seen 20 miles out to sea. Today, the lighthouse is automated, a 1,000-watt quartz iodine lamp providing 2.5 million candle power flashes every 10 seconds. One of the most recognized lighthouses in North America, Hasita Head is a truly perfect fusion of design and environment. Its beauty provides inspiration for countless artists and photographers who try to capture on film and paper the essence of the queen of the Oregon lighthouses.
The Yaquina Bay Lighthouse overlooks the entrance to Yaquina Bay in Newport. It was constructed in 1871 as a combination keeper's quarters and light tower and is notorious for only being in service for three years. The 51-foot high tower was fitted with a modest fifth-order lens brightened by a whale oil lamp visible 11 miles out to sea. The caretaker of this new facility was Captain Charles Pierce. He and his wife Sarah and their nine children moved from the isolated Cape Blanco Lighthouse. They hoped to make the bustling community of Newport their permanent home. The advantage of a lighthouse that combines the keeper's quarters with a signal tower was that even on the stormiest nights, the keeper kept dry, only having to climb a short ladder from the small upstairs bedroom to check on the lantern. The Pierce family made the lighthouse their home for three years, having their tenth child while stationed here. But through a bureaucratic mix-up, Another, more powerful lighthouse was built on Yaquina Head, north of Newport, forcing the lighthouse service to abandon the Yaquina Bay Lighthouse. The Pierce family was sent back to their lonely watch at Cape Blanco. The small lighthouse lay abandoned for 15 years. Although the Corps of Engineers and Life Saving Service used it between 1888 and 1933, it gradually fell into disrepair. When the Oregon State Highway Commission announced plans to demolish the lighthouse, Newport residents banded together to save the landmark. The fully restored lighthouse is now part of Yaquina Bay State Park. When the politicians in Washington approved plans for a new lighthouse to be built at a place called Cape Foulweather, they might not have realized that the Cape's real name was Yaquina Head, and that Yaquina Head was only four miles north of the just completed Yaquina Bay Lighthouse. Yaquina Head Lighthouse is the tallest in Oregon with a 93-foot tower that rises 162 feet above the ocean. The lighthouse, with its beautiful natural setting, has been the scene for many movies, commercials, and television shows. It sits in the middle of the Aquina Head Outstanding Natural Area, a protected nesting site for thousands of marine birds and a refuge for marine mammals. The tower was completed in 1873. It attracted many curious visitors, probably because it was the tallest structure on the coast at the time. The lightkeepers were always good hosts, giving tours and delivering their share of tales about the lighthouse. Inside the tall tower is a spiral iron staircase with 114 steps leading up to the lantern room. The large lantern room contains a fixed first-order Fresnel lens manufactured in 1873 by Barbier and Fenestre of Paris. It consists of six prismatic lenses and two and a half panels acting as reflectors. The present light source is a 1,000 watt quartz iodine lamp paired with a backup bulb. The flashing beam is visible 19 miles out to sea. Like most lighthouses, 
Yaquinahead is not without its ghost stories. One such tale states that during construction of the masonry tower, a worker fell into the gap between the two walls. His body was too difficult to pull out, so it was sealed up inside. Many people claim to have heard ghostly footsteps ascending and descending the tower's iron staircase late at night. Perhaps it is the poor worker seeking a way out of his brick tomb. Whatever the season, Yaquina Head Lighthouse remains one of the most accessible lighthouses on the coast. The beauty of the beacon and the surrounding natural area will continue to make the Aquina Head Lighthouse a favorite stop along the Oregon Coast Highway. Notice is hereby given that on or about January 1st, 1890, a fixed white light of the first order, varied by a red flash every minute, will be shown from the structure recently erected on the extreme westerly end of Cape Mears, Oregon. The light will illuminate the entire horizon. The focal plane is 223 feet above mean sea level, and the light may be seen in clear weather from the deck of a vessel 15 feet above the sea, 21 and a half nautical miles. David B. Harmony, Office of the Lighthouse, Lord Washington, D.C., December 2nd, 1889. Ten miles west of the town of Tillamook, on the Three Capes Loop Scenic Drive, sits the smallest lighthouse in Oregon, the little iron giant of Cape Mears. Although the tower is less than 40 feet high, it sits on a headland 200 feet above the breaking waves. The Cape Mears Light was the only Oregon lighthouse constructed out of large sheets of iron, which were hauled up by wagon train from a dock on Tillamook Bay. The tower was completed and dedicated in 1890 with uniformed members of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers present. The attached workroom wasn't added until 1895. Two keepers' quarters were built inland from the lighthouse, connected by a thousand-foot long boardwalk. Large spring-fed gardens and pasture land kept the isolated keepers and their families well-fed. Visitors were welcomed at Cape Mir to a tour of the lighthouse, possibly even a meal in the keeper's residence. The Cape Mears Beacon used a powerful eight-sided first-order lens crafted by Henri Laporte of Paris. Light could be seen over 21 miles out to sea, its signature being 30 seconds of white light followed by five seconds of red. The lens turned by means of a clock mechanism powered by a 200 pound weight that had to be rewound every two and a half hours. Many sailors found this diminutive lighthouse to be indispensable. For five miles north of the beacon was the narrow entrance to Tillamook Bay over the treacherous Tillamook Bar. For over 70 years, the Cape Mears Lighthouse provided guidance to coastal ships. The lighthouse was decommissioned in 1963, replaced by an automatic light nearby. Volunteers worked to save the historic structure from demolition. And in 1980, the restored lighthouse was opened to the public. The 
Little Iron Giant is now the main attraction at Cape Mears State Park. On a small piece of rock, a mile and a quarter from land, sits a particularly infamous lighthouse, Tillamook Rock. From the beginning, the small beleaguered sentinel and its isolated keepers endured a multitude of hardships. From ferocious storms that would toss boulders through tower windows to months of isolation when no supply ship could get close to the dangerous rock. Construction of the Tillamook Rock Lighthouse was controversial from the start when the first brick mason to attempt a landing on the rock slipped into the waves and was never seen again. In spite of public criticism, the lighthouse service persevered, and after a year of blasting and building, a new 62-foot high lighthouse stood on the rock. But just days before the first order lens could be lit, tragedy struck. On the night of January 2nd, 1881, in stormy seas, the British ship Lepatia drew near the still dark Tillamook Rock, so near that workers on the small island could hear the captain issuing orders to his men. The men on the island scrambled to build bonfires to warn them off. The ship veered away just in time, and all on Tillamook Rock breathed a sigh of relief. With dawn came a terrible discovery. In avoiding the rock, the Lupatia had driven straight into Tillamook Head and now lay broken in the surf. All 16 men aboard died. The lone survivor was a dog, a young Australian shepherd found among the rocks of the headland. Referred to by some as Terrible Tilly, Tillamook Lighthouse was in operation from 1881 until 1957. Put up for auction by the federal government, the property went through several owners before being bought by the group Eternity at Sea. They've sealed off the windows and lantern room and turned Tillamook Rock into a columbarium. Fittingly, the lighthouse that once put mortal fear into men is now the home of the dead a sealed crypt containing the ashes of those who have paid to make this sea-bound rock their final resting place. These nine lighthouses still stand along the rugged Oregon coast, reminders of a time long gone when sailing vessels and steamships braved the rough seas and watchful lighthouse keepers tended their oil lamps through stormy nights. Thanks to the dedication and hard work of many individuals, these beacons continue to send their light out across the waters of the Pacific.